Jess, thank you very much indeed for reading. Well, good morning, everybody. Please could you keep that passage of the Bible open in front of you? Our simple task together is to try and understand it and to feel some of its implications for our life in 21st century London. You may also like an outline of the talk, which is printed on the back of the notice sheet that I think you were given as you came in. Let me say then that our issue this morning is one of authenticity and delivery. And it's uh, one with which we're familiar from many walks of life. We say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Because we've all had that experience of having a, a plate put in front of us and we thought that the food looked wonderful and then we bit into it. I've just looked at my wife at exactly the wrong moment in this sentence. <laughs> but you know what I mean. You look in, you, it, anyway, it doesn't always turn out quite so well. I think I shall have dog food for lunch. Um, we, say, we say all that glitters is not gold. And we'll all know someone who's traveled to a far-flung country and walked down a back alley and bought some very reasonably priced diamonds only to come home and discover that they possess the most expensive glass earrings in London. I was brought up on the mantra, if something looks too good to be true, it probably is. And yet I'm sure we've all been taken in at some stage by phony advertising or the exaggerated claims of a salesman. And so we've come to learn that hype is not the same thing as reality. It's a trivial example, but I remember buying a tent many years ago and being assured in the shop that it was, it was so waterproof you could sleep under a waterfall. And the, the one and only time that I slept in the tent, there were just a few drops of rain but somehow they seem to multiply as they found their way inside. So I guess we've become pretty cynical as a culture. Uh, we know that advertisers and politicians often make big claims, but what really interests us is can they deliver? And it's a crucial question, uh, not just with products and politicians, but even more when we come to consider our most fundamental beliefs in life. Uh, is there a God? What is the meaning of life? What's going to happen to us when we die? Uh, we pick up our, our own answers, our own beliefs. Uh, in many places along the way, parents and teachers debate and intuition, the media play a part. It would be odd if we never stopped and asked the question, but do my beliefs stack up? Do, do they stand up to scrutiny? Can they actually deliver? And I'm talking about that today because the point of our passage is to demonstrate very plainly that Jesus really can deliver on all of his claims and promises. That he's the real deal. He's been put through the furnace, tried and tested in extreme conditions and proven himself to be 100% reliable. So we're working our way through this section of Luke between now and Christmas, but this passage is a fitting climax to the little chunk that we've been looking at over the last few weeks because it's been a section of extraordinary claims about Jesus. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, John the Baptist said of Jesus, he is the Lord God himself, and through him the whole earth will see God's salvation. It was a claim reiterated last week. We heard God the Father speak from heaven and say of Jesus, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. And if you were here last week, you remember that William drew our attention to the significance of the moment. God only speaks from heaven directly three times in the Gospels. So we're meant to concentrate on these 11 words and see what are they teaching us. And especially so because they're a, a blend of a couple of famous quotations from the Old Testament. The, the first bit comes from Psalm 2 and tells us that Jesus is God's son. That he is the ruler of all of the nations of the world. And the second bit comes from Isaiah 42 and tells us that Jesus is God's servant. That it's through him salvation will come to anyone who asks for it. Now, those are, those are big claims about Jesus. But there comes a moment when the talking has to stop. And so now, this week, if you like, we've looked at the brochure in the car showroom, and now is the time for the test drive. Will Jesus actually deliver when the devil gives him both barrels? 
the question takes on an even greater significance, and we have a, a quick think about the history of those two titles I mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, the end of chapter 3 last week reminded us that the first son of God in the Bible was Adam, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And he didn't fare too well in the role of being God's son. He ignored God's word and started living for lies instead. Uh, then came the people of Israel. And in various places in the Old Testament, they too are called the son of God. And elsewhere, they're called the servant of God. But they too failed showing themselves to be a, a disobedient son and a rebellious servant. So if we can put it like this, the track record of sons of God and servants of God thus far in the Bible has not been happy. So the crucial question is, well, will Jesus be any different? Will he be a true son and servant? Does he really rule? Can he really save? And in each of these three very, very famous temptations that we're considering this morning? The answer is yes. So we've only got one point to think about really this morning, and Luke's aim is to bolster one of the, the core foundations of our faith. All others have failed, but Jesus is the genuine article. Let's see it demonstrated in the first temptation, where we see that Jesus resists the temptation to serve himself. And we'll read from verse 1. It's page 1035, if you've flipped your Bible shut, 1035. And I'll pick it up halfway down the right-hand side there, next to the big number 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It's such a cunning temptation. Just like Israel, God has led Jesus out into the wilderness. So here he is, at a moment of great personal weakness, literally starving, and so the devil causes him to, to doubt the goodness of God. Looks like God has forgotten you, Jesus. He, he provided uh, bread for Israel in the wilderness, but he hasn't done any for you. Why not, why not take matters into your own hands? God, he knows that you're hungry. You deserve it after all of this time out here. Just think how much better equipped you'll be for your ministry with a bit of physical sustenance inside you. He won't begrudge you a loaf of bread. It's time to look after number one. Go on, use your power to serve yourself. It's very subtle. And so much of our own moral failure springs from the same root. We don't really believe that God is good. We don't trust him to provide for us and care for us. We don't really believe that the hand that he has dealt to us in life is, is good and from a loving father in heaven. And so we decide to serve our own interests instead. Adam in the God and Israel in the wilderness and in, in my life too, it's exactly the same. There's a clear choice maybe between one course of action which gives us what we we think we want but is morally wrong and another course of action which is morally right but doesn't give us what we think we want and if you're anything like me you make the wrong choice far too often but Jesus is God's son and servant. And so he replies, yes, I am hungry, but there are more important things than my physical needs. So, no, I'm not going to use my power to serve myself, devil. I'm going to trust in my father and in his goodness. His word is all the food that I need. It was crucial for Jesus to resist them, this temptation. And the job of God's servant was to sacrifice his own interests and die for the sins of God's people. He was to, to stand in for them as a, as a substitute. He was to bear God's wrath for them. 
And so being a servant would hurt Jesus personally. In Gethsemane, his sweat would become like drops of blood falling to the ground. On the cross, passerby would, would shout, if you are the son of God, come down. It's the same temptation as here. So if now, at the first time of asking, Jesus were to use his power to serve himself, well, he'll never be a faithful servant later. But where all others had failed, Jesus succeeded. Because he really is God's son. He really is God's servant. We see it again in the second temptation as he resists the temptation to worship the devil. And this time we'll read from verse 5. The devil took him up and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory. For it's been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me... It will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And again, it is so seductive. How many times, even in the, in the last week, have you, have you felt the pull of your own pride? Maybe the desire to, to bend the truth to make yourself look good in the eyes of those around The desire to shore up your own position and to make sure that your own plans and desires are furthered. How many times have you been tempted to take the easy way out of a situation rather than doing the right thing? Again, I have to admit, I do that far too often. If doing the right thing is an inconvenience to me, all too often I choose the easier road. Well, that's the choice facing Jesus as well. We can think of the great empires and dynasties of history. The Egyptian, Persian, Roman, Greek, British, American, and Chinese. We can think of all of their glory. Their treasure and jewels. Their armies. Their culture, their beauty, their power. And the devil showed them all to Jesus. And said to him, doesn't even need to be for long, Jesus. Just bow the knee to me once and I will give you it all. And what makes it so evil is that Jesus now has two offers on the table, this one from the devil and the one from his father in heaven and both are offering the same thing. God had said to Jesus, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. But you'll see that the root is very different. The devil saying, just bow the knee to me once. The father saying, Jesus, it is written that my servant must suffer and die and then be raised to glory. So the devil's really saying, you don't need to die, Jesus. You're a king. Let let me give you a shortcut to your glory. I'll... Build you a ring road around the cross. Just come straight for glory now. It's a temptation that remained with Jesus throughout his life. There was that time when the the disciple Peter finally twigged who he was. He said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And from that moment on, Jesus began to explain that he had to die. And Peter said to him, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Maybe now we see why Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God. No one before Jesus had resisted this temptation. But Jesus had learned the path of obedience. Only one Lord would have his worship. Only one God would he serve. And so he shunned the lies of the evil one and became obedient, even to the point of death. We've got one more temptation to reflect on before we consider the implications. It's another bit of proof that Jesus really is God's son and servant. He won't test God. Let's read from verse 9. The devil took him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, 
if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You can't quibble with what the devil's saying. He's quoting from Psalm 91 in the Old Testament, but his Bible handling is way off the mark, because in the psalm, God promises to protect those who trust him if they happen across danger. But the devil twists it around and tempts Jesus to manufacture a situation in which God will be forced to protect him. So in reply, he quotes from Deuteronomy 6, which expressly forbids testing God in that way. Again, we're being reminded of God's people Israel in the Old Testament. Only days after being rescued from Egypt, they grumbled against God, testing him. Is the Lord among us or not, they asked. Does he love us or not? And they stopped trusting. Gloriously, Jesus doesn't make the mistake. Where they tested, he trusts. He doesn't need extra proof that he's God's son. He doesn't need extra proof that God is for him. At his baptism, his father had said, you are my son. And that word of promise was enough for him. I remember struggling with Christian um, assurance, the, the confidence that I really was one of God's people when I first started out in the Christian life. I knew that in the Bible, God had said that Jesus had died for me and that he was for me. But I, I wanted more than that word. I remember praying like mad for a, a tangible experience of God. Maybe some spiritual gift from him, some extra proof that he was, he was real. You know, I'm grateful now that he didn't give it to me. Otherwise, I'd have been basing my faith on the sinking sands of that experience rather than on the rock of his word. But this is a defining moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. There had been so much hype around his birth. That star had traveled across the sky. The angels had sung. The shepherds had wondered at the infant child. There had been many claims about him. But now the spotlight turns directly onto his own life. No human has ever been able to resist the lies of the evil one. No human has ever been perfect. Every son of God had forsaken the love of his father. Every servant had chosen instead to serve himself. But where others had stumbled, Jesus stands firm. Where others have strayed, Jesus remains loyal. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in a short space of time, but I hope we can see that God has just one very simple lesson for us this morning. Uh, we're to think of this passage not in the first instance as a, as a blueprint for how we should face our own temptations in life, but as being like a, a hallmark on a piece of silver or a, a kite mark on a, on a new product, a badge that confirms the authenticity of Jesus and says, even at this very early stage of the gospel, the hype is justified. He's been through the furnace. He's been tried and tested in extreme conditions. And he is the real deal. This is the point that's being pressed home. Jesus really is God's son. That is, he really does rule. Jesus really is God's servant. That is, he really can save. Now that confidence is absolutely crucial for anybody who's even beginning to think about living for and speaking for Jesus in today's world. It's been said that if you want to evaluate a belief system, if you want to see whether it stands up, there are two questions that you need to ask. First, is it intellectually credible? That is, is it true? You have to ask that question because nobody wants to base their life on a lie. And second, does it work? Not just is it intellectually credible, but is it existentially satisfying? Will it work in the real world of life, on the sports field and in the home and in the office and by the graveside? And you have to ask that question because a philosophy can sound great, 
But if it has no power to change people in this life, and if it cannot give true hope in the face of death, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. Is it true? And does it work? So we're going to end with a simple compare and contrast between a belief system that centers upon Jesus and any other. Let's ask our two questions. First, are they true? Uh, The Christian faith says that Jesus is the son of God, that he's the ruler of all of the nations of the world. And here Luke's been stacking up evidence for us to help us believe that claim. The Old Testament promised a, a son of God like no other. One to whom God would give the rule of the world. John the Baptist said, it's Jesus. God the Father spoke from heaven and said, it's Jesus. And today Jesus has confirmed that by doing what no one in history has done before him. We could read on in Luke for more evidence. We could look at the quality of his life. We could look at the power of his miracles, the authority of his teaching. Supremely, I guess, the victory of his death and resurrection. But in page after page of Luke's history book, we were being told time and again, it is all true. So belief in in Jesus isn't an exercise of blind faith in the teeth of the evidence. It's not like believing in the proverbial fairies at the bottom of the garden or a proverbial giant teapot orbiting around the sun. It's coherent, it's rational, it is true. But what of any other belief system? Well, in the light of the evidence of Jesus Christ, in the light of his perfect life and death and resurrection, we can say with confidence that any belief system that does not acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of all must be a lie. Jesus isn't a prophet, just a prophet. That's a lie. He's not just a a holy man. He's not just a, a good teacher or a great leader. That's a lie too. He's not deluded. And he's not deceptive. He is the divine Lord of all. So what of the belief system at the center of your life? If it is Jesus Christ, you can be confident to live for him and speak for him because you're building your life on a rock of truth. But if it's not Jesus Christ, then right at the core of your being, the foundation stone upon which you're building your life and all of your hopes and all of your dreams and your family is out of step with reality. And no one wants to live a lie. So why not acknowledge Jesus today as the Lord of all and the Lord of you? So much for the truth of our beliefs, but do they work? You could approach the question from lots of different angles. We could say, does your belief system make you feel better? We could say, does it um, improve your health and the quality of your life? Does it give you a sense of purpose and direction? But the most important question is, does it have an answer for your own moral failure and God's anger at it? Say it's the most important question because the answer has such long-reaching and far-reaching consequences. My belief system could make me feel better for 30, 40, 70 years, and that would be worth something. But what of the next 70 billion years beyond that? I need to be forgiven. Well, God spent the whole Old Testament telling us that only he could save us from our sins and his anger. He said, I I am the Lord, and besides me there is no saviour. And he said that the one through whom he would offer salvation to the world was his servant. He said the servant would be remarkable. Perfect in every way. But that like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, this servant would walk willingly to his own death. To bear the griefs and sorrows of his people. To be crushed for our iniquities so that all of our guilt might fall upon him. And here in Luke 4, Jesus takes the the first step down that road. 
It's just a first step, but it's a decisive step because it marks out the course that he will take for the rest of his life. And one of Luke's big emphases throughout the gospel is that Jesus never once diverted or flinched from that path. Never once did he take the easy way out. But in life and in death, he served God perfectly so that he might offer salvation to all who would only ask for it. Again, what of your own beliefs? Have you asked this question of them? It seems so strange that we're we're cynical about the claims of politicians and advertisers because we don't want to be taken in. But that on this most important issue, we so often leave our own beliefs unexamined. So what is your, your answer to the problem of your own moral failure and God's anger at it? Are your beliefs able to, to deal with that? Can they bear that weight? Are they able to open up the gates of heaven to you? The answer is, no, they can't if you're not believing in Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. Only Jesus can open the gates of heaven to us. Think about it. Why would God allow his son to endure 40 days of hunger in the wilderness? Why would he make him walk the road to Jerusalem? Why would Jesus willingly bear the wrath of his father upon the cross and die if it was not the only way, the only way by which any of us could be made fit for heaven. Forgive a graphic illustration, but imagine yourself drowning in a spiritual sea and along comes a lifeboat named Jesus. You push it away from yourself. And you say, no, I... I don't want Jesus to save me. I like to think I'm okay on my own. I don't really believe I need saving, actually. Your head starts to go under. But still you persist. I'm hoping that my good works will save me. All this talk of lifeboats is so exclusive anyway. Can't we just live and let live? Surely we can all find our own rescue. It's time to wake up. Left to ourselves, we're drowning. There is only one lifeboat, and his name is Jesus. No one wants to drown, surely. Why not ask Jesus to save you today? Most here I know have done that already. And I hope that today for you is a day of rich confidence. Let me end with an Olympic story. Um, apparently more than 17 million of us tuned in to watch Mo Farah win his 10,000 meters gold at the Olympics. I know some of you had tickets, were there in the flesh. You can gloat over coffee afterwards. But for those of us mortals watching on TV, uh, we got to see the race. We got to see all the mobotting stuff going on. His little daughter running out onto the, the track and losing her shoe, all of that. But one of the lovely things for me was listening to the comments being made by Brendan Foster, the former athlete on the BBC. Uh, some may know Foster himself had won a bronze medal in 1976. Another Brit, Mike McLeod, had won a bronze in 1984 in Los Angeles. But no Brit had ever won gold. And you could just hear the, the relief and joy in Foster's voice. He kept saying over and over again, you'll probably remember it, we've just witnessed something that none of us has ever seen before. It's the first time it's ever happened. And Steve Cram was trying to calm him down because he was getting a bit too excited. But he, he was carrying on. We've just seen a British man win gold in the 10,000 meters. I've waited my whole life to be able to say that a British man had won gold in the 10,000 meters. A week later, it was the same again. Foster said, I'll never tire of saying these words. Mo Farah is a double Olympic champion. Heard him on TV the other day. Still, he he hasn't come down yet. Because where all others had failed, Mo had succeeded. I want to say that is the merest token, the merest trivial token of the relief, the delight, the joy, the confidence that should fill us as we read Luke 4 this morning. Adam had tried 
but he failed. Israel had tried, but they'd failed. King David, good for a bit, then failed disastrously. Solomon started well, then uh, tailed off. You and I, failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. We turned our back on the love of our Father in heaven. We chose to serve ourselves. But where we have failed, Jesus stood firm. He loved God perfectly. He served God perfectly for us. And all of his perfection and purity was given to us at the moment that we first put our trust in, trust in the death of Jesus, if we've done that. So that when God looks at us now, he doesn't see our moral failure, incredibly. If we trust in Jesus, he doesn't see our weakness in the face of temptation. He sees the perfection of his son. Praise God then for Jesus. God's son, God's servant. He really is the ruler of the world. And if you've trusted him, he really has saved you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we're reminded of our own failure (coughs) when we consider Jesus and his perfection. We're reminded of the ways, sometimes small, sometimes big and very graphic, that we've turned our back on you, rejected your love as our Father, and failed to serve you as we should, but instead served ourselves. We're reminded, too, that nothing and no one else in whom we could put our trust uh, can bear that weight. No one is fit to rule us. No one else is able to save us. We certainly can't save ourselves. And so we praise you for your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that though he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. Thank you that he was willing to be obedient to you to the point of death on a cross. Thank you for this confirmation that he really does rule the world. And that where all others have failed, he has succeeded. And he is able to save all who ask him. We praise you for him in his precious name. Amen.